Pan Pan Psychast. Part two: the four noble truths. The Dharma. We threw this word around, willius nilius. What does it mean? <laughs> the Dharma is essentially the cosmic order, the great order of all things. Mm. But in day-to-day use amongst your Buddhist friends, you'll probably use it to refer to the teachings of the Buddha. Think of it like Andrew's favourite philosopher at the moment, St. Thomas Aquinas. We've got natural law, the big thing, but natural law really just refers to the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas mm. and his ethical system. So when we say the Dharma, we're referring to the teaching of the Buddha. There are three refuges in other words, three sources of authority for Buddhists. We've got the Buddha, Nai's teachings. We've got Dharma, which is that thing I've just mentioned, the order of things and, he's, and the Buddha's teachings. And we've got Sangha, which is the community of monks. And that's where you learn all the things you need to know about being a good Buddhist. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning that Buddhists believe that the Dharma is eternal. And in some texts, it actually mentions that the Dharma will outlive Buddhism itself, mm. that there will be a time where Buddhism itself will disappear, whether yeah. it's because of I don't know, environmental collapse or the sun explodes, but that this Dharma is the, the truth of the universe, an underlying truth within the universe itself that objectively exists and will mm. outlive potentially even this universe. Cool. Do you want to kick off with some epistemology then? How does the Buddhist arrive at these great truths about the world and the human condition? The Buddha, and we said this in our first episode, was quite selective with what he thought could be considered truth. And more importantly, he was very careful with his words and would decide to either say, I'm prepared to comment on this, whether it's one, I think that you can actually handle this message in the right way. Hmm. Or somebody would ask him something about something in where he would just have to say, or perhaps say nothing at all. (laughs) Let's just not say anything about that and focus on the (laughs) stuff that i can tell you about why is that though well he says that most of the types of truth the communities of people that he was around at the time were unsatisfactory Mm. and you can imagine what those sorts of things might be so somebody might make a simple appeal to authority and say this is the way that the vedas have always taught us Mm -hmm. and therefore we must continue down this path Mm. or it's simply our community and the and the elders have said something and I will follow that too. Or I just have faith in something, so I have a belief that it is true, but I have no real direct experience. Mm. So the Buddha prioritized the idea that through direct sense experience of something, can you only then say that you fully understand and know the truth of something? Mm. And that's when if we go quickly back to his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, he, through his own meditation realizes some truth Mm. and then when he passes on this message he says don't just take my word for it if you try this stuff too you will also come to see the same truth that i have and he's very clear on that he doesn't want people just to hear the word of the buddha and then say ah the buddha said it so i'm good to go they have to actually realize it for themselves and that is so vital for the buddha's path for everybody to take He's not an armchair philosopher, our boy Gotama, okay? He's not that kind of guy who's going to sit back in his philosophical armchair with his pipe and his slippers and go, yep, I have realized the truth, read my book for five ninety nine on Amazon, and that's all you need to know. No, just like Andy said, just to reinforce it, you have to experience it for yourself. Mm. And if you don't, then you aren't really following his teachings, and you won't be able to realize this truth for yourself. He's not saying, do what I do because I'm right. He's saying, give it a go. Try it. I would say with this as well i would be careful of linking this directly to what we might consider empiricism in the word today Mm. because the buddha even with his claims about rebirth says he remembers all of the eons of rebirth that he has gone through that's quite a claim to make but at least he's saying i have direct experience of that now of course you can't test that empirically in the way in which Mm. some people might want to do so (laughs) in today's world but at least he's saying i don't just have faith that i will be born again in the the next life or something or in his case will not be born again he's saying i know because i remember that stuff so in that sense he is a bit of an armchair philosopher and that he arrives at truths just through speculation or just through argument in and of itself but what he is against is He's anti-dogmatic. Don't Mm. just take somebody's word for it. Mm -hmm. He's against appeals to authority and appeals to 
uh, like authoritative texts or people or mm-hmm. scholars or the, this is just the way things are. Sorry to say this, I don't mean this in a derogatory way. There's a really boring discussion, which is, is Buddhism a religion or is it a philosophy? But one thing we can say for certain is that it's full of interesting philosophical approaches and arguments. Mm. And those are some of the things we'll talk about. So he doesn't want us to just accept dogma, just appeal to authority. He wants us to either form arguments to reach truths or experience something yourself. Mm. And this is quite a reasonable way to approach your epistemology, isn't it? A couple of good quotes. No, not by hearsay, nor by tradition, nor by indulgence and speculation, nor because you honour the word of an aesthetic, but know for yourself. I want to say there's a a great key word, uh, aviacata, which means really things that are not revealed, things that you can't say anything about. Much like in many philosophical traditions, both East and West, there is this idea that language is incapable of grasping certain things. We can... Mm. We can put concepts and frameworks onto things, but sometimes we reach a limit to that. And most of the problems with metaphysics come when we start trying to say things, applying concepts to things that really are impossible to conceptualize. Mm. And so I mentioned this um, uh, earlier. The Buddha wants to remain silent almost on the things that people ask him about Mm. the gods and stuff, Mm. because realistically he knows that whatever he says is probably going to be misinterpreted. It's alluded to that the Buddha actually knows more Mm. than he's letting on, but any attempt, he knows that any attempt that he explains, it cannot work. So there's that, there's a great quote from him here, which is saying exactly what you're saying. He says, which is more, the few leaves in my hand or the leaves in the forest? And they say, oh, well, there's lots more in the forest, he says, because that is not useful, though. It does not lead to nirvana. That is why I have not told you those things. So there are some things which he's alluding to that, the fact he's Mm. keeping us from us. He only wants us to engage in metaphysics and big thinking to the extent that it helps us overcome the suffering which we experience in the world. It has to be practical. It has to be purposeful. Yeah, and he has a priority, right? So when he's being asked questions by either his followers or just random folks on the street, he does say to some followers, that is an important question now, and I'm not going to answer it. Or like Andy said, not respond at all. Mm. So he has a priority. He, he genuinely thinks that the, the moral priority is the here and now. How can I make my life better? Mm. How can I escape suffering? For him, that is the key point. That is the start of where everything else comes from. I think there's a famous story, isn't there, if someone comes up to him and goes like, how was the universe created? And effectively, he says something to like, it doesn't matter. And he uses like a, a quite a funny analogy as well. Explain it's it. Malan Kiputa, who comes to the Buddha, and he says, I've got these big questions, Buddha. He says, you know, is the world eternal? Is it not eternal? Is it infinite? Is it not infinite? How does the body and soul interact? He says, quote, if he does not explain them, I will leave the order <laughs> and go away. And the Buddha says, suppose, Makaliputta, a man is wounded by a poisoned arrow and his friends and relatives bring him to a surgeon. Suppose the man should then say, I will not let this arrow be taken until I know who shot me. What his name was, his family was, whether he was tall, short, or medium stature, whether his complexion was black, brown, or golden, from which village, town, or city he comes from. No, there's a practical mm. problem here we have to deal with. I just want to pull the arrow out your side. We don't, you don't need to know who did this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's where we get that analogy of the Buddha being the kind of doctor. Mm. He, he can see the, the problem, diagnose it, and then actually understands the source of getting it out. All the other things at least at that moment in time, aren't important. But interestingly enough with that story as well is that the Buddha says to him, did I make any claims about those things before? Did I say, come to me and I will tell you the truths of all things? And he has to reply, well, no, no, you didn't. So the Buddha never promised anything that he couldn't directly deliver as far as what he believed was true. Hmm. There's that, a uh, no, couple of great stories, and I'll keep them very brief here. There's one where he goes to uh, Kasputa, this, this place, and all the people say, oh, everyone who visits here seem to only spread their own message. And they say, all others are wrong. And he's saying, why? Don't just take their word for it. Think for yourselves. And once you think for yourselves, you'll realize that the Buddha's a mystery. This is right. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, he's very pluralistic. You're allowed to have your culture, your religion, your background, as long as they don't conflict with the, the noble truths, which we'll talk about in a moment. Well, I think that it's either Jainism or Hinduism, but it's probably in the same thing that I, I would have come across as well, where he actually, somebody says, I'm gonna, I want to renounce my way of doing things, my community, and join you. And the Buddha actually in that moment says, no, don't do that. Mm. Continue under your mm. previous master, mm. 
but you can still adopt some of the ideas yeah. that I've done. So it's interesting that even then, Buddhism is something that could theoretically fit into whichever culture it is, as long as you accept some fundamental truths about the world. There's another great one with uh, Pukusati, who there's a brilliant story which really captured my imagination when I read it. The Buddha's sheltering in some kind of cow shed or barn, and then this other young man's put into the barn with him, and the Buddha says, oh, you know, what's going on? What are you doing? And he said, well, I've heard of this guy, the Buddha, and <laughs> I've renounced my former life. And now I'm like this homeless wanderer trying to achieve enlightenment. I love this stuff. And he's like, oh, tell me about the Buddha. And he's like, tell me how great it is. He says, that's pretty cool. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then he, he basically teaches him. And after a while, the Buddha's talking to him. The guy realizes, oh, wow, I'm actually talking to the Buddha. Oh, no. And the Buddha's like, okay, you're ready. You, 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 you're you fully prepared to be a part of, of the order of monks of, of the Sangha. He's like, Have you got your robes? Have you got your arms bowl? And he's like, no. He's like, well, you need your arms bowl and your, and, your, and your robes. Go out and get some. Come back and I'll ordain you. So he goes out and he's run over by a cow in the, in the middle of the street. And the Buddha's like, yeah, he's probably achieved enlightenment. <laughs> but, but I was like, okay, I don't know why he's died by this cow. But the point is that he didn't know that it was the Buddha. Mm. Yeah, he was listening to his truths and nodding and realizing they were reasonable. It doesn't matter whose mouth they come from. And he didn't want the order to rely on him. He wants you to, it's a cliche in philosophy, was it? figure it out for yourself. Well, as we'll see, we're going to explain how you might figure out some of these things for yourself. What we're about to tell you, it doesn't matter who it came from. It doesn't matter that it's Buddhism. Think of it as an independent philosophy and think whether or not you, know, you think it's reasonable or not. The Four Noble Truths. The whole of Buddhist philosophy centers around these four noble truths. Think of it like a medical diagnosis. We want to say, what is the disease? What caused it? Can we cure it? And how, if we can cure it, do we treat it? Mm. So, first of all, what is this disease? What plagues us all? So, the Pali word we would use for it is dukkha. So, if you hear us using the word dukkha, this is the first noble truth. And this means that suffering exists, ultimately, the first noble truth. And for the Buddha, this is the key to understanding everything. He says, you suffer. Other people suffer. This is a truth. This is a fact of existence. And they suffer for many different reasons. So there's seven main unavoidable types of suffering. So things like birth, old age, sickness, death, sorrow, not getting what you wish for, and coming into contact with unpleasant things. The Buddha teaches that at some point in your life, you will come into contact with these seven unavoidable types of suffering. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important that we stress the different layers here of suffering, because it's often said that suffering itself is not a great translation, but there's not necessarily one word that's going to capture this idea of dukkha. Hmm. So you mentioned a lot of the bodily direct suffering that hmm. somebody might experience, but we also know that there are layers to things that might cause suffering that go far beyond just getting physically hurt or something so when a cow crushes me to death that's going to cause me <laughs> some really bad taste <laughs> i feel sorry for the cow it's actually a person Andrew. <laughs> yeah it's going to cause me physical pain i'm sure and, until i pass away but there is suffering that is linked to insatiability and clinging and mm. stuff which we are going to have to, to delve into with the second noble truth but Think about it this way. That things, one of the elements of Dukkha is that things change. And mm. because things change, states of affairs will inevitably lead to suffering. So even basic things like hunger, because your body changes throughout the day, you will need to be replenished. And mm. that will inevitably cause that dissatisfaction or that slight discomfort or annoyance. And these tiny little things are all Dukkha. It doesn't have to be mm. this great big suffering that mm. you might experience if you're severely harmed and one critique of buddhism that is often thrown at it is that it's quite pessimistic wow suffering exists that's a lovely philosophical insight siddhartha thanks very much but i think there's a more interesting nuance here so buddha isn't saying that happiness doesn't exist like if eating a chocolate bar makes you happy then that happiness is real it exists but what the buddha is saying is that happiness will not last you will eat the chocolate bar and then you'll want another one or you'll eat too many chocolate bars and then you'll get really big and then you'll be unhappy with that. That There isn't, so far anyway, according to the truths, a permanent source of happiness. Everything we look at to bring us happiness doesn't give us a lasting happiness. So the insight is simply that suffering exists. It's not personal. It's universal. 
to be really clear, because we've thrown a few things around there, we've got suffering, which is called ducka ducka, suffering, suffering, mm-hmm. physical suffering you might undergo. You've got uh, suffering because of the impermanence of the world. So like Ollie says, happiness doesn't last, things change, people die. We've all got also got suffering from a uh, conditioned state. So you might desire something that actually, in fact, isn't something you should desire. It's mm. so, like you think it's a really good idea to like run your factory farm chicken business but actually that that thing you think is good isn't in fact good and that ignorance is a type of suffering Mm. so three types so actual suffering suffering because things are impermanent and happiness doesn't last and also these long-term mental formations you have of things that aren't in fact desirable that's the first noble truth i wanted to just stress the ducker of of composite things that links us nicely into and i think this is a good place to to bring in another term there are so many of these lists in buddhism but the three marks of existence Mm. are so core to to dukkha that just mentioning the term anisha right now which quite literally just means the instability of things that lack permanence so you can look at any example of even the things that you think are the most permanent big mountains that seem to last the test of time while everything else crumbles around it but give enough time and the mountain will crumble Mm. too Mm. and we know then that because of that, if all things are made of composite things, all things will crumble. If we get closer to home, then it just means that everything that we attach ourselves to, everything that we love, even our bodies and ourselves change and eventually rot and decay. Mm-hmm. If you can't accept that, you're going to suffer greatly. Yeah, not just living things, but also non-living things like Andy mentioned, like a mountain or it could be, I don't know, a rusty nail, you leave a nail out in the rain or a rusty house. But even our own minds mm. are in a constant state of flux and change. They change all the time. And with that, your feelings, your longings, your emotions, they're impermanent. They don't last. And again, our minds, ourselves, even ignoring everything that influences them, do cause us suffering as well. So we've got those three different types of suffering. And the second one is this impermanence. And it's a good job we're emphasizing it because it's so important, isn't it? It it stems from this idea of what we might call condition genesis or dependent arising. Mm. We've mentioned this a few times. In Buddhism, everything depends on something else. So if everything depends on something else, if you wobble one little bit of it, then everything's always going to be changing. Mm. So because this flux exists, it's never going to cease to exist. And that's true of the cosmos as well. The quote from the Buddha here, O bhikkhus, the cycle of continuity, samsara, is without visible end, and the first beginning of beings is not to be perceived. So we've got this eternal universe. So although there's not you know, just a little bit of philosophical analysis here, he's saying there's not a start to the universe. It's on a cycle. He thinks he's explained it. We all know Leibniz's argument, sufficient reason, just because you're passing the book We do on, all know that, Jack. <laughs> just because the universe... I'm doing a little circle in the air for listeners who can't see. It needs a cause. So he's not actually getting around the age-old philosophical problem, but we should think of this as why he thinks that everything Hmm. is always changing because everything depends on something, something's changing, then everything's changing. With the with these composite things then, uh, just a quick analogy. This is something that, again, I I think I've, I've picked up on a couple of different introductory bits where let's say if you take an example of a candle and you have the flame there Mm. and the buddha might want to say then linking into what you've just said there jack how does the flame exist because we can point to one particular thing and say ah well that's the flame but of course we know that once we begin to examine all these composite things that are all interconnected which give rise to the flame is that we need the oxygen we need the wax we need Mm. the wick Mm. we need perhaps the match that lit the thing in the first place Mm. with none of those things arising there is no flame and of course then the flame might cause smoke to exist and all sorts of things and the buddha claims then that every single thing in existence is like the flame there is Mm. no one thing that you can point to and say that's a thing Mm. all things are a combination of factors yeah did you want to get into now the second noble truth and link this in here so we've got this analogy of the buddha as a doctor you sat in the uh, the doctor's office you sat with the buddha he's taking your temperature goes i'm i'm sorry buddy you've got a You've got a case of suffering there. You've got some dukkha. <laughs> it's a bad doctor. <laughs> you went to the doctor and they said that. You're suffering. You're suffering. And, and you're like, oh, no. So your next question will be, well, what's causing my suffering, doc? <laughs> so my next question would be, oh, you are a doctor, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we have the second noble truth then, which is called Sumadaya in the Pali, which is the cause of suffering is desire. So the Buddha diagnoses the cause of suffering in the world as desire. Now, this is difficult in terms of translation because desire is a word that can mean lots of different things in different contexts. Mm. So when we often use desire, we often look at it as something is like wanting something, 
in terms of like or feeling like you need something that desire so it could be desire for like a romantic attachment it could be the desire for a cheese sandwich it could be the desire to i don't know have time stop and desire for things to not move and buddha says that this is the source of dukkha i think it's in the pali tana meaning craving and a quote from Uh, the Buddha here. Now this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this craving which leads to renewed existence. Craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. I wanted to point out one important thing with, I I was reading that the heart of the Buddha's teachings by Thich Nhat Hanh, and he, he says, to be careful with this, the Buddha is not saying that the only origin of suffering is craving, because as we've already said, you can get, you get run over by a yeah, cow. Yeah, if I get if I get run over by a cow, it's not <laughs> it's not my craving that causes me any suffering. It's the fact that there is literally some physical pressure being imposed on me, and that's mm. the thing that hurts. But I think what what is important here is is that perhaps with things like that, those are inevitable things of existence which are mm. gonna happen regardless. The craving bit's important because it's the one thing perhaps that we have some level of control over. Mm-hmm. So if if something does hit me and i uh, it causes me harm now if i then crave for a world where i never get hit and nothing bad happens to me then suddenly the the hit feels somehow worse than it was before mm. because i expected things to be a particular way and now my expectations have been ruined or even after the pain i might then dwell on the pain for longer than is necessary and i cling on to that as well so it's craving i think links into all of the types of pain in yeah. a really nice way mm. With that in mind, then, just because a couple of other types of craving mentioned the craving of basic sense pleasures and mm. things like power and wealth mm. and, and of course, like food and, and, and drugs and alcohol and all the things that people might crave as a, as a way of indulging the sense pleasures. Then there's the ideas of craving a strong sense of identity, yeah. where mm. if you if you have a particular picture of yourself and then people don't respect that image that you want to create, that's going to cause you a lot of pain and suffering. So let's say you think of yourself as a very well-to-do businessman, nice suit and tie. You go to you go to a meeting and then suddenly your trousers fall down or something like that. <laughs> it never happened. The image of yourself is completely destroyed in that moment as everybody sees you for, for well, a regular human being who also <laughs> is a bit of a joke. That's going to hurt a lot more if you take yourself really seriously and you're clinging on to a particular identity. Whereas if you're a little bit more lighthearted with that, you might be able to pass that off as less uh, embarrassing than it might otherwise be. And then the other type is aversion. Mm. So let's say then this happens to this particular business person. And from now on, they avoid all meetings because they're afraid of being made a mockery. But that itself, by that aversion, Mm. is clinging on to this idea that I need to be protected and I can't go out into the world and do things because if I do, I will mm. be destroyed. Yeah. There's a really, really nice visual element to this too. So if you're near a computer, you can Google the three poisons. And what will appear is a Buddhist painting or image of symbolic animal representations of three sources of this suffering, which is greed, ignorance and hatred represented by a pig, a snake and a rooster that are all biting each other's tails. Mm. And the teachings of Buddha says that not all dukkha, not all suffering, but a lot of our craving and our desire comes from these three places, like Andy's mentioned. Greed, you know, wanting a, a shiny car, a new shiny car, things like ignorance, thinking that alcohol and drugs are going to give you long-term happiness, or even things like hatred, like wanting someone else to have their trousers fall down at a meeting and laugh at them, that these things may give you happiness and pleasure, but it is fleeting and certainly not permanent. And while I don't know if it's an official accepted Buddhist teaching across the board but i've definitely come across the idea that ignorance out of those three almost gives rise to Mm -hmm. to the other two because if you're completely ignorant of say the well-being of others and and perhaps the reasons for why people do things you could imagine getting a lot more heated and and feeling anger and hatred towards someone if you don't understand the context in which they're from and, and all sorts of things equally if you think that buying lots of stuff and getting that fancy new car is going to fulfill you ultimately is that it, the reason why you think that is because you're ignorant to the truth mm. so mm. both of those two things stem from the ignorance mm. so just a quick recap here we've got the fact that suffering exists that was the first noble truth and then we've got this thirst or craving for uh, these uh, these pleasures or this absence of suffering or to become something which is inevitably going to make us suffer because those things aren't going to last it's going to be 
impermanent. And just to reflect on what you were both saying there, as always, when we're doing these episodes, it makes you reflect on things perhaps you didn't realise mm. over the last week or so when you've been doing all the reading, just how rich psychologically this is for the time mm. and how influential it is on modern therapy today and things like CBT and thinking about our stoicism episodes and so on. I want to give a couple of examples for this impermanence and craving on the second noble truth. Uh, I've, I read a great one, which I think maybe the Buddha uses himself, which is the idea of the house builder. Oh, he does. Uh, again, I, th- I think I know. Seeking, not finding the house builder. I travel through life after life. How painful is repeated birth. House builder, you have now been seen. You will not build the house again. So there's no suffering without people who allow that suffering to happen. Mm-hmm. Think of the house builder. We've got these inanimate objects, things out there in the world which don't have value. But the person craves certain things like the house builder, the agent using the blocks. And that's how this house of suffering is built. You need both parts of the equation. Mm. There's a brilliant story in one of the suttas which really explains these first two noble truths in its core essence. And this is the story of Kisa Gautami. My second favorite sutta, Jack, after Siddhartha in this one. Nice. Uh, so let's go for it. So there, the Buddha is traveling. He is in a village. He gets approached by a lady called Kisa Gautami, who is a very very sad lady she's extremely upset and sad because her son unfortunately has passed away it's very vividly described she walks up to the buddha places his dead corpse in front of him prays to him and says buddha i've heard you are wise and and thoughtful and a great thinker can you bring my son back to life if you are so wise if you're so clever surely you can do that and the buddha has a very interesting response where he says if you can go all over this village And find me a mustard seed in some stories. In other stories, it's a grain of rice from every single house. Or just from one house. Or from one house that hasn't had a death. Then I will bring your son back to life. And Kizukatami is well happy. She's like, brilliant. One grain of rice. (laughs) She's well happy. One mustard (laughs) seed. Easy peasy, Siddhartha. Let's go. So she... She walks off. And as she's going to the house, she's run over by a cow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's impermanence. Yeah. Uh, she, she goes to lots of houses, knocks on the door. Hello? Uh, do you, have you ever suffered a death in your house? Yes. You know, unfortunately, my mother passed away last year. Oh, okay. Not, not, not. Next house. No, 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 no. And something really lovely about these suitors is that the characters in them, or the people in them, realize it for themselves. They don't have to be told. So she returns to the Buddha and says... I can't find a single house that hasn't been touched by death. And then he asks her, well, what does that mean then? And she goes, ah, it's, it's dukkha, it's suffering. Everyone experiences death. It's one of the, uh, the four sites. And from that, she's kind of overwhelmed with, I guess we could use the word epiphany, that, ah, this is just something I need to almost deal with and handle. And Kisukatami goes on to become a follower of the Buddha and becomes the first female arhat in Buddhism. And I really like that story because, again, Kisukatami comes to this conclusion herself. She's almost kind of like Siddhartha at the start of his story, where she's unaware that this is something that will affect her in her life and affects mm. every single person. So coming back to the fact that Dukkha is, a, is an eternal truth, you know, as long as you're human or potentially a being of some kind, you will experience suffering. And that the cause of her suffering is wanting her child to come back to life. The Buddha couldn't have brought him back to life. Mm. He knew that she wouldn't be able to find a single mustard seed or a single grain of rice. Uh, and I really like that sutra. I think it really explains those two noble truths quite succinctly. Let us pause for a moment to hear a quick message from our sponsors, the Reading Our Times podcast, hosted by the brilliant Nick Spencer and produced by the Theos Think Tank. Books can change our view of ourselves. Love, over and over again, goes to the heart of what I'm saying. Not love in a kind of saccharine, easy way. Love is very hard. (laughs) Proper, enduring love is the most difficult thing that we do. They can change our view of the world. In terms of wealth share, it's even more extreme than that. Basically, the bottom 50% owns nothing at all. They can change our view of the times we're living through. And I think one of the big phenomena of the 21st century is going to be the tremendous struggle for the soul of different faiths. Join me, Nick Spencer, for a new podcast called Reading Our Times, in which I talk to leading writers and thinkers about the books and the ideas that are shaping our world today. Coming up in the series, Thomas Piketty on equality, Charles Taylor on the secular...
Nicky Gerard on dementia, Ian McGilchrist on the brain, Nigel Bigger on human rights. The first series of Reading Our Times will be out this autumn, weekly, and you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and on our website, theosthinktank.co.uk. We highly recommend checking out the show. Nick and his guests will be exploring lots of the big questions that you'll be interested in, particularly if you enjoy the Pan-Sidecast, and they take the time to explore the ideas properly. But, and it's a big but, they don't play Mystery Philosopher at the end of their show. So if you don't like Mystery Philosopher, then you'll love reading our times. On a serious note, check it out. A link is in the iTunes description for the podcast and a link to the Theos Think Tank is there as well. You can also find further information on our website. All right, let's jump back into the discussion. I am the app man. Hey! I am the app man. Hey! I am the walrus. Goo 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 goo. There's no such thing as Atmans or walruses, and the Beatles would be would know that if they paid attention in class. Let's talk about the <laughs> doctrine of no self. This is a one of the most radical ideas in Buddhism. It goes against all of the other world religions and nearly all of the philosophies of the last two and a half thousand years. No self. What are we talking about? If we go back to the second noble truth and we look at the the truth of the origin of suffering, of craving, and particularly this idea of craving and a permanent identity, a permanent self, and all of the baggage that comes with have, seeing yourself in a particular way. Now, of course, I used a bit of a silly example of seeing yourself as a businessman who's really serious. If we actually look at what the Buddha would have been more concerned about is the fact that people would have believed that they had a permanent soul. Mm. But not only that, because that's one element of it. And you might think, well, everybody has this eternal permanent individual soul but not only that they believed that this self was eternally linked with everything this term here upanishadic monism that all souls are actually one soul Mm. all part of what is called brahman which is the ultimate reality Mm. think about how much security that creates if you realize that you are the universe Mm. that this permanent like ever existing thing and once you realize this and you achieve what we could call mo- moksha of releasing yourself back into brahman that gives this perfect sense of identity mm. Mm. like we mentioned in that first installment this now hindu idea how do i connect to the universe and then i need to know what i need to do so think about it in western terms according to the hindus at the time we have a soul and that soul is a part of like this universe which Mm. is identical with god and you can then get into a kind of heaven and this is the idea which the buddha is going to go against completely yeah and this is connected to the caste system too right so if you're born in the lowest caste and you're stuck at the bottom doing all the horrible horrible jobs you can take comfort in the fact that as long as you fulfill your dharma which is to do those horrible jobs you will also you know achieve this moksha or this moksh you know uh, union with brahman and again not just comfort but the organization of society And that's why we spent so much time talking about that context, because you can now see, we've just said, Buddhists don't believe there is a traditional Atman or self. Mm. That I does not exist. Now, we can't just say that without supporting some of the Buddhist reasoning behind it, because this is can potentially become quite confusing if we don't explain it clearly. So the Hindu idea is Atman. Now, the Buddhist idea is anatta. So the Sanskrit of anatta is anatman. So literally Mm. the A, like amoral or apolitical. Atheist. It's the absence of something. It's the negation of something. So Mm. literally uh, anatta means the negation of the atman. There's no such thing as the Hindu idea of the atman. The reasoning that he has behind this is built upon his understanding that of all things are composite. We have this interconnected universe of all these little bits tied together and we already said about the candle and the flame yes conventionally i can say here's the flame and everybody knows what i'm saying but if we look take the step back and maybe reference what we might call ultimate reality is is that i can't have the flame without all the other things he says if everything is like this why do we think the soul this this atman is any different Mm -hmm. you're gonna have to tell me why you can say this is the exception to the rule 
Of course, he doesn't think you can say that. And so he says, well, what are then the composite parts that we might then say creates this self sense of Atman, Mm. but really the Atman doesn't exist at all. So I think a nice way in here is an analogy which the Buddha himself uses. Mm. Imagine that I've arrived to see a a brilliant king and I've arrived in my chariot, per se. And I point to the chariot and I say, king, what is the chariot? And he says, Mm. oh, it's the wheel. It's that wooden Mm. part there. It's that glorious seat and those cool rims I installed (laughs) last week. Rims (laughs) on the chariot. (laughs) It's a cool chariot. They're very attached to the chariots. <laughs> which, which part is actually the chariot? Or is it just a bundle of different, as Andrew said, composite things? Is mm. it just a collection of them? So there's no chariot behind the chariot. It's just a bunch of things put together which are themselves impermanent. Can I add a more modern analogy to yeah, your sure. joke and update the Buddhist? Let's talk about the cake. No, 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 not yet. I want to talk about the cake later. Can we use an example of a computer? So whether it's your phone or a laptop you may have or computers that lots of people use every single day, like what is, quote, the computer? Is it the hard drive? Is it the mouse? Is it the monitor? Is it the graphics card? Is it the plastic and metal that form it? Is it the ones and zeros that are flying through it? A lot of us would say, like, the computer is the combination of those things together. You can't pick it apart and find, quote, the computer. Hmm. By definition, it is completely reliant on lots of different parts working together. And very interestingly, I like the analogy about the computer, completely reliant on humans to put it together. Nice. One final, final example here. (laughs) Gilbert Ryle uses the example of going to Oxford University, seeing all of the different buildings, and then asking... But where's the university? Yeah. It's a category mistake. You're trying to find something that mm. is actually just a name for the collection of yeah. the things that we've all just been yeah. saying. Like team spirit, he says as well, Gilbert Rodgers. He's like, where's the team spirit? It's, like, well, it's not a physical thing. It's, yeah, it's a collection of, of, of team behavior. So here we've got one of the most famous philosophical arguments made by the Buddha. He says we're made up of five aggregates. There are five things that make us people. But actually, there's no thing behind those five bundles of things that make us who we are, which is transient, which is permanent. The five things that make up who we are are temporary. So just like the computer, just like the university, just like the chariot, there's not actually a chariot behind uh, the wheels and cogs in this thing. So Mm. should we break down what these five uh, aggregates are? Sure. Should we start with the first one? This is the easiest one, I think, to understand, which is form. This is our bodies, if it was us, or physical objects. So the form of an apple, the form of a table, the form of a person, the, the physical nuts and bolts matter. Just the body, yeah. yeah. The body. So like the physical body, mm-hmm. that's what makes it. Uh, feeling, another one. So the sensations I experience, my joys, my pains, my worries, those feelings make up part of who I am. Next one could be perceptions. So I'm able to, using the senses from the body, in this case, mostly the eyes, but it could be the ears and even touch. And I can sense things and then be aware that there is something in front of me. So in front of me, I have the perception of a computer. And I will also form a concept from this particular image, mm. which also might very link nicely into our, my emotions because I might have certain feelings mm. of whatever objects I uh, ap- apparently see. This one's really interesting. So it's not just perceiving the world and discriminating the world, but categorizing the world as well. Is That's what we do with our perceptions. Mm. There's not just five senses. For the Buddhists, we can also have it. We also have a sixth, which is the mind. So you might you can't see colors. Well, most people claim they can't. You can't feel sounds, mm. but the mind can perceive sounds, can perceive taste. So there's six senses, p- types of perception rather, uh, for the Buddhist impulses. So mental formations like thoughts and opinions, mm. and, and lastly, and finally, consciousness, our awareness of the things around us, almost kind of like an umbrella section which includes all these things together, form some form of consciousness. Now, that is a very, very loaded word, and we've talked on this podcast a lot about what consciousness is. I think for the Buddhist, in its simplest form, it's just a general connectedness to the world around you, being aware of these four other aggregates working together. I was, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, that last little bit. is The consciousness gives awareness to all the other aggregates, because yeah. without that, that, you wouldn't even know that you had a body or that you were sensing things, or you couldn't have volitions of thinking you wanted to do something or not something else, because if you weren't aware of that, then none of, none of it would matter. Is it time to talk about cake? Well, just on consciousness, because it's, it's really important. It's the, it still is, because we've done so many episodes on consciousness, it still is the, there's something it's like to be this thing. Mm. So the consciousness and lines, material, there's something it's like to feel, like to have a body, there's something it's like to perceive, there's something it's like to impulse. So it underlies them in that 
they, these other four aggregates manifest themselves in consciousness, like you experience them, so it's your experience of the world. And the Buddha, way ahead of his time, says that like there are different types of consciousness, different types of phenomenology. Phenomenology mm. just means how you experience the world. So think about uh, Michelle Montescu, that interview we did with her. She said it's not just uh, sensory phenomenology, sensory experience, but also you can have mental experiences, con mm. cognitive experience. So the Buddha says we should think of consciousness in the same way. He likens it to fire. We name a fire by the type of fire it is. Like we might have a wood fire, a straw fire, a hell fire, or a cease fire and whatever the thing which underlies the fire that's what it is so we might have like sensory consciousness mm. or mental consciousness so let's take all these aggregates together then and talk about cake if you're just thinking that you have a soul or a self let's say you walk into a room and see a piece of chocolate cake now if you are not into the buddhist idea of no self you're probably just going to walk in and go ah i see a piece of cake but if we take part these these five aggregates, we can say, you know, the first bit is the form. You enter the room, you see the piece of chocolate cake, the form of it in front of you. The sensation is you, you see that slice of cake and it gives a feeling inside you of anticipation. You're like, I really like chocolate cake. I really want to eat that cake. The perception is that you recognize the slice of cake. You recognize you've had cake in the past and you really liked it. So you might like this slice of cake, too. The mental formation, you form an opinion of the cake and decide whether you want to eat it or not. You're like, OK, well. I've had chocolate cake in the past. I know I like chocolate cake. I want to eat that cake. And then finally, your consciousness is all these things connected together by a general awareness of the world. You look around, you're like, well, there's nobody here. The cake's mine. <laughs> like, I know that's a bit of a daft example, but all five of those aggregates working together. I guess the big question then is, is that, so we have these things, but as with everything else, sadly, is that none of these are permanent mm. and they're all changing at different times and the obvious example would be something like form that the bodies of anything and if we just go directly to ourselves is that my physical body will change and develop mm. and even my senses and stuff will change and develop through time so i might lose some of my hearing or my sense of smell or whatever and mm -hmm. even my taste buds might change over time as i develop things and that's a basic one but if all of these elements are constantly changing in tiny little ways mm. maybe not noticeable immediately and there might be a constant thread throughout it where one thing conditions the next and so i could still appeal to some idea that there is an andrew horton there but every single minute it's constantly changing and mm. i can't actually once i take again that tiny step back and see that there is a permanent self there in the middle of any of this so the buddha's saying what's this unchanging transient part that stays the same throughout time. That means I can say I'm the same person today as I was five minutes ago or 20 so, so on years ago. Is it my physical body? No, it's changed a lot since I was one years old. It's it, Literally, I replace all my cells. What is it, like every nine or 10 years, mm. every cell in my body? My feelings, I feel different today than I did this morning, mm. right now, than I did this morning. So my feelings change over time. So I can't be identical with my feelings. Perceptions, I perceive things differently all the time as well. They change. I don't have the same perception all the time, so that can't be the unchanging thing I am. Mm. My impulses, the same applies. And consciousness, you know, I fall asleep every night or I, I go unconscious and I kind of drift off and I, I daydream. These states are always changing and therefore none of them are the same. Therefore, I can't be the same thing I was earlier today or a few years ago. I think it's really easy for people to grasp certain elements of that particularly if they've not come across this idea before in just normal language it's it's vital that we use it because it, it solves a whole bunch of linguistic problems so, but when i say my body or even like my arm or my hand is that i can feel like there's a separation between me and the hand like the hand belongs to me but then i ask the question well what is the me that the hand belongs to and so people might understand that but, and the, but i think then people want to say I, but aren't i my thoughts I, I can have this inner voice in my head that when I think and I don't have to speak out loud and I can think, surely that thinking voice is me. But the Buddhist still wants to then say, but even the thoughts aren't you mm -hmm. because you can have these issues of thoughts can think themselves and pop into existence. This is something we talked to with Robert Wright, the, the author of Why Buddhism is True, which is these these thoughts might almost be com combating as it were under the surface and they just pop up into your consciousness there was no you that decided that that thought was going to come into your experience at that moment in time it mm. just did mm. easy examples of that if you just say and i always use this example with students where you just use the classic don't think of a pink elephant or something or you ask somebody think of a number and they say 
oh, I, I, I picked the number six. And you say, well, why didn't you pick four? And, it, mm. and it's like, well, I can't answer that question because six just happened to come into mm. my consciousness. Mm. Why that did, I don't know. And so I can't find the permanent me that is the thinker. You might want to say then, am I the observer of the thoughts? Yeah, but, but even that is not a permanent thing. Good. So that's I... your consciousness. Your consciousness is aware. But as we just said, consciousness is one of the five aggregates. It's not the thing that I can point to and say, that's me. So I think what you just said at the end, that's really good. Because I think when Robert Wright says that, he might be touching on a separate issue, which is whether our thoughts are voluntary, which is a much more complex idea than whether or not I'm the same throughout time. Think about this in a Cartesian way. When we did our Descartes episode, I think therefore I am. Well, the Buddha says, all you can say is like a thought. And we spoke mm. about this when we did Descartes, mm. didn't we? So maybe I'm just the observer of thoughts, like the demon placing thoughts into my head all the time. I can still say, says Descartes, that I'm me. But no, you can't, says the Buddha. There's no such thing as you because you change throughout time. A bit of analysis here, because I think this is the last deep philosophical thing we'll discuss in this installment before we get into wider metaphysics mm. in next week's. A, a criticism of the Buddha is that he's not giving us an exhaustive account of what it is to be the same person throughout time. And this is something Greg spoke about off microphone a few times when we did the Robert Wright one. Some people say, well, I'm the same animal I was than I was yesterday. And that, that species doesn't change. And that's who I am. You've been overthinking the debate. That's one possible solution. I'm not saying it works, but by saying these five things or what it is to be human, mm. and none of them apply, therefore there's nothing there is to be human, makes a, an inductive leap. Mm. His conclusion should be, these five things don't make you human, not no self. So he doesn't give us enough firepower to fire the no self cannon. But on top of that, what I was thinking was, reflect on some of our episodes we've done in the past with people like uh, Sam Coleman, uh, and we discussed some of Barry Dayton's ideas in that one. Consciousness, and this is what it seems to me throughout this whole system, so maybe we'll pick up later on as well, is that consciousness underlies the other four aggregates that we've just discussed. A flicker of consciousness goes from one body to the next upon death. It seems to me that consciousness is the most likely candidate on the Buddhist's account of what it is to be the same person. Now, that always changes. I have different conscious thoughts now than earlier. I fell asleep last night, so did I die last night? These are big problems. But Sam Coleman gave us a nice example that, actually, no, you might just... you you have unconscious quality like in the middle of the night when you have a pain that experience is real you're just not perceiving the world you're still conscious in a sense consciousness the stream of consciousness continues if you don't like that idea barry dayton suggests that may i think he says something like we are the faculty of consciousness the potential for consciousness we're identical with that thing that gives rise or is consciousness whether or not it's turned on or off if that makes sense Th th these are good candidates i think for saying that maybe the buddha isn't onto a, a, a certain universal truth and he and that might very well be the case but i i still feel like the buddha does enough to say for most people when they think of who they are is he pokes enough holes in that concept which le it leaves you with this sense that you are not a directly thing that like a thing that does flow through time as permanently as we almost pretend is the case mm. and i don't think there is good evidence to suggest that we are exactly the same person or self that than we where we were when we were five as compared to we are now other than the fact you said earlier we are the same animal sure yeah. but what does that really mean for how i actually think and feel on any given day almost nothing apart from my memory of events but even mm. then we know that my mm. memories might be wrong because mm. i might have they might have changed and developed over time themselves and every time i recall they change slightly and, don't they yeah good um we might say that and the buddha says there's no such thing itself we might say no it, maybe a more uh, modest claim might be that the idea that you think is yourself is is not what you think is yourself an atman is a hindu's fiction it doesn't exist i want to finish this section with perhaps two thoughts one just because the Buddha says there is no self does not mean that he denies personhood. We still have to care about how we treat mm. people. We can't just say, I don't exist. You don't exist. Does it really matter what we do to one another? No, because we know that suffering exists, that I experience suffering. And while I am not permanent, the suffering ex is still very much real mm. and I should still have compassion to someone else. So you can't say, well, is it just nihilistic? Nothing matters. No, no. They, absolutely not in any stretch of the imagination. Mm. Two, this, we got really deep and quite abstract there. 
to bring this right back to why this matters is that just remember that it's the clinging to this identity and self which he says doesn't exist is a really really great source of ignorance mm-hmm. and suffering mm-hmm. so let's bring it back then so we've been talking about the four noble truths so you've gone into the doctor's office Siddhartha's there with his white coat diagnosing you he said sorry buddy suffering exists dukkha number two samadaya the cause of your suffering buddy is your desire and your craving and that could be to lots of different things we've just gone through, including this idea of self. So, so far, pretty cheerful visit to the doctor. So probably a time to move on to the third noble truth, then, Naroda, that there is, in fact, a way to remove this craving and desire. So all that nihilism, all that pessimism that's thrown Buddha's way, they only got two truths in for the third noble truth. You can take a little bit of a step back and go, ah, OK, there is a cure to this craving. What's great about this is that it, flows so logically into what he's already said because think about it for a second if he says all things are composite what if we remove an element of the chain Hmm. maybe we actually take away the thing that exists so if all things are aggregates you take away one of the aggregates that thing no longer persists Hmm. surely suffering like everything else is a combination of aggregates what if we remove one of those elements what happens to suffering once it's gone Hmm. Well, it moves on to the fourth noble truth, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, we, the third noble truth is famously the shortest, and it's pretty much that. There is a cure for craving. Brilliant, Doc. So let's go. Where's the pills? He's going to put it in the fourth one. Yeah, it doesn't have yeah. the same ring to the no, three noble truths. No, the three truths. noble truths, yeah. So then we have the fourth noble truth, Maga. How do you remove desire and craving to eventually cure your suffering? Middle way, eightfold path. The middle way, baby, is about <laughs> avoiding the two extremes, minus the baby, okay? It's about avoiding a life of extreme luxury and hedonistic pleasure. It's about avoiding a life of extreme pain and suffering. If you follow the noble eightfold path, eight different things you are expected to do, if you cultivate these different things, then you will eventually avoid suffering and it will cool and calm your craving and desire. And if you follow these things, hopefully you will reach a state called Nibbana, or the, which is the Pali or the Sanskrit, which is Nirvana, which is when this is completely cooled. Ooh. That desire and that craving almost seeps out of your being and you become a Buddha. Cool. And we'll discuss that in some detail next week when we talk about karma and moral value. We talk about reincarnation mm. and samsara in some more depth. And we talk about that ultimate release, that burning out, that Nibbana or Nibbana in next week's installment. So quick recap. The... To live is to suffer. We might have physical or mental suffering. We might have suffering from craving. That suffering from craving comes from the impermanence. Happiness won't last. In fact, things are so impermanent that you don't even exist as you think you do. You need to let go of this idea. The third one, there is a cure. The fourth is the Eightfold Path, which we're not going to talk about for another two weeks. So (laughs) if if you're dying to find out how you can relieve yourself from suffering, then you can relieve some of our suffering and support us on (laughs) patreon.com. With that self you don't have. (laughs) The Mystery Philosopher. Welcome to Mystery Philosopher. We're doing more birthdays. Hey, Hey. happy birthday. We need it this time around after another. Well, it's not, it's not pessimistic, it's realistic. It's realistic, it's Jack, real. come on. I'm sick of that. It's not optimistic, <laughs> it's not pessimistic. It's realism. No one actually says, yeah, I'm pessimistic. I'm optimistic. Like, it's just realism. I think that book was written in the 50s, so you've got to give it a bit of, uh, bit of leeway. Well, this person wrote his book around maybe the same time. Ooh. This week marked the 110th birthday of the philosopher, one of which we've discussed in the past. See if you can guess who this is. We say that a sentence is factually significant to any given person if, and only if, he knows how to verify the proposition which it purports to express. Wittgenstein? It's not Wittgenstein, but you're on the right line with language. Ooh, I think I know who it is now. Well, Andrew's still pondering, so it's fastest finger, really. Is it Freddie Air? It's Freddie Air! Were you thinking Freddie Air for a moment there? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That was a no, but... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was. Uh, join us next week when we'll be discussing the metaphysics of Buddhism. Do you know we've got 18,000 listeners in India and about two or 3,000 in China? Namaste. Do you think they'll still be listening after our <laughs> Yeah, after we've just said Yeah, after you've just said that. <laughs> I just said hello. They all tune out after this episode. Yeah. It just dips <laughs> zero. I'm sorry, guys.
Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan Cast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>